The Hague and the Netherlands and abroad, abroad and also representing Dutch government in technical fees relative meeting in the EU. He is also in charge in organizing fish inspection in the Netherlands, including fishing vessels, and to carry out mission with EU veterinary inspectors to verify their compliance with EU legislation. Gerard is also the Netherlands <coughs> head of Netherlands delegation at the Codex Committee on Fish and Fish Products. Gerard, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you put my slides up, please? Okay, Dean, uh, can you put uh, Gerard's slides? The, um, Can you see it? Yeah, but this is uh, slide number eight. I would like yes. to start with. Yeah, it's sure, sure. So <laughs> I will, <laughs> I will put it uh, the first yeah. one. I will just uh, checking. Uh, okay. Yes. Well, uh, just a minute. I will put it in the thing. Ah, then bisa bantu. Saya bantu ya, Bu. Okay. Ah, uh, Bapak bikin saya stop, stop share. Uh, just a minute, please. Uh, the IT will uh, help. Great. Okay. Okay, Pak uh, Andin. Baik, Bu. Okay, silakan. Okay. Yeah, I can. Start here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Please go ahead. Okay. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to talk you to talk to you about fish handling, um, the hygienic way. In fact, the way we like to have fish handled in the, in the European Union, and and the Netherlands, uh, my own country. The subject I will touch upon this morning, um, this morning for me in the Netherlands here is cold and rain, um, are the general principles of the EU legislation, the prerequisite program and management responsibilities, and I will give a small insight into staff hygiene the European way. Next slide, please. Now, the general principles in the European Union are that the consumer expects and the consumer gets a very high level of food safety. The consumer government takes care of food safety and does not want to uh, judge really the, the, the safety of the food when he or she buys it in the supermarket or on the marketplace. Um, 
new legislation says that we really do not want any cross-contamination. Um, and that is uh, executed, that is, that is through control throughout the food chain. So it's not that we want uh, the end product to be good, we want to be want to have a safe product throughout the whole food chain from water up until the plate uh, in our home. And that is executed by a high level of hygiene and of course we do not expect to be to have a fraud for instance have water added and not declared it on the label. Now we want to trust the producer who is uh, responsible and therefore there must be full transparency uh, when a food uh, um, establishment is, um, is inspected by the food inspector. Now the EU of course helps with a lot of guidance documents on the EU website and it's easy to access and you can go there and, and have a look for yourself. Um, where it lists the key obligations for food business operators, which will be shown in the next slide. Next slide, please. That's the previous one. Yes. The key elements for food business operators uh, are listed here. First of all, we want to have no, yeah, the cooperation with the competent authority. The competent authority uh, is the, the food fish inspection agency. Um, we want to have transparency. We want to trust the food business operator that he is uh, that it, that he producing safe food and. Um, and he, he must be uh, honest, not mislead the, the, the consumers. Uh, and of course, uh, the responsibility for food is with the producer. Uh, traceability is, of course, a very important step, and there's some new legislation uh, in the making at the moment. For now, it is one step forward and one step back, uh, where each producer has to show to the competent authority where he got the food from and where he is sending it to. Now, important is that we want to sit and think already uh, at problems who have not occurred yet. Therefore, we want to have withdrawal procedures ready before withdrawal and recall procedures are really necessary. And that is sort of a way of HACCP thinking. Eh? This is what you do in the morning when you go out of the house to your work or shop, you look outside and you see if it's raining or not. And if it's raining or might be raining, then you take an umbrella. So you think ahead of problems which might occur and have a plan ready if they occur. Um, Cooperation with the competent authority is, is really important because um, we want to trust the producer. We want to trust him or her to produce safe foods. Um, uh, because, and the reason is, the, the competent authority, the fish inspection agency, is not on the work floor all the time. We are only there. In the Netherlands, actually, we uh, are not even uh, there once a year for, a, for, a, for an inspection. Um, therefore, we really need to have a good trust in the food producer. Uh, next slide, please. Now, this is directly taken uh, from the, the, the legislation. Food business operators must ensure that all stages of production, processing and distribution of food satisfied requirements laid down in the EU le legislation. Uh, 
And before you start production, you have to have already a prerequisite program. Next one, please. Um, the food safety management responsibilities are that the management is responsible to, to have a food safety policy, food safety training of staff, commitment that they carry it out, they need to have resources, compliance, and they need to have a system developed and implemented. That are the responsibilities of management of food uh, business operators. Next one, please. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yes. Now, having a quick look at the prerequisite program and general requirements, in fact, all this has to be in place before you even start producing one fish product. You have to have premises and a structure. You have to have a planned layout to prevent cross-contamination. And that is mean that, uh, that there's a logical stream of products uh, coming in, uh, raw products and finished products going out, waste is going out, and these uh, 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 raw products and finished products uh, lines should not cross each other. That is uh, a cause for uh, cross-contamination. For instance, sometimes you have uh, zoning where you cook a product. Of course, the cooked products can never become in contact with the raw products when uh, and that also we, is to prevent cross-contamination. Now, even before starting uh, operation, you need to have a clean, cleaning and sanitation plan. Uh, and of course, cleaning needs to be done with potable, with, with the water quality of potable water. And why is that? It, because um, the water that touches the fish and if the fish is on a, on a surface, it touches the surface, that water, we think, is a part of the food. So that part of the food should be of drinking water quality. Even before you start production, you have to have a maintenance plan for plant and equipment and a calibration plan uh, in place. The next one is the personal hygiene plan. Again, this is all before you start even have fish in the factory. Everything needs to be geared to the prevention of cross-contamination. <clears throat> cold chain maintenance. How do you keep the cold chain? A pest control plan. And pest control is very often uh, sourced out to a company. Um, but as an inspector, then I always check what is sourced out. Sometimes only rodents uh, are sourced out, but of course you need to check if there are flies uh, and other uh, pests in your area. So this is all being here, here, all these subjects you need to think of before start production. Waste management, what is going to happen with the waste? Are you store it, will it be collected? And then of course, storage of the finished product, distribution and transport. These are all sort of um, um, things that will happen when start production and you need to plan uh, in action before this production really materializes. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, and of course, supplier control. Purchasing approved supply list and especially the specifications. Uh, for instance, some things you uh, have no control of. If you have, uh, uh, for instance, heavy metals in fish which are caught in open waters, you have no control over that. But somebody needs to make sure that there are no heavy metals in fish. So you ask your supplier, I want you to guarantee that you are supplying the raw materials within the legal specification. Again, traceability, one step forward, one step back, as it is at the moment, um, there will be 
new legislation on, on uh, traceability. Um, and why is traceability so important? Because if there is a mistake somewhere, if somebody gets ill or even dies uh, from a fish a product that you have produced, um, that is something you really would like to avoid. But also, if this happens, if people fall ill, and it happens, and it happens in my country, it happens everywhere, then you want to find where this problem occurred, where the contamination of a bacteria, for instance, happened, who made a mistake. And not that we really want to punish the people who made a mistake, but we want to prevent the problem from happening again. That is the reason that traceability is, is, uh, is so important. And therefore also, of course, that internal traceability <coughs> is very important too, because in then it's not required, but it's good practice. <coughs> Excuse me, next slide, please. Now, again, literally from the EU legislation, every person working in a food handling area is to maintain a high degree of personal cleanliness and is to wear suitable, clean and where necessary protective clothing. Why? Again, avoiding cross-contamination, preventing cross-contamination. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, of course. No, one, one slide back. Slide number 10, please. That's it, thank you. Now, of course, personal hygiene of staff, it is really, really important. And if you are in a position where you can hire staff, which has already been trained in personal hygiene during food processing, that is perfect. If that is not the case, then you have to train people into these matters. Uh, to start, of course, food workers need a health certificate, which is up to date and which incidentally, uh, if there is an inspection um, from the Congress authority or in, in the country of Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, the inspection of the EU, if you are exporting to the European Union, <clears throat> we will check, and now I'm speaking as an EU inspector, we will check health certificates. Are they up to date and are they corresponding with the staff which are on the on the work floor? Another important thing is, and that is of course very difficult, uh, because people are really not very likely to report if they have an illness because they want to continue working, they need to do they need the salary. Still, it is important that you have your food workers report if there is a disease, if they carry a disease, to prevent again the disease entering the food. And even now with COVID, there is there is some some um, indication that COVID may be transported uh, to uh, frozen foods as well. It's important that you trust your workers to tell you that they are ill. And of course, how to do that is completely up to you. But uh, for instance, to make sure that they do other things uh, if they are have a certain illness and they are fit enough to work, but not fit enough to prevent cross-contamination, then maybe give, him, give them another job where they do not come in contact with food directly. That way, they will be less afraid to report an illness uh, to you as the manager. Now, of course, the staff need facilities. They need sanitary accommodation. They need to go to the toilet. Uh, they need changing areas and changing areas always inside the building so that they do not have to go out where there is a chance of cross-contamination by birds or other sources. Um, staff eating facilities. Uh, the reason the, 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 the avoidance of cross-contamination uh, need to be 
thought of before you create um, the, the, the staff facilities. Um, next slide, please. Here, are, actually, you see uh, bacteria, which are the uh, source of contamination. Right. The, it's the management's responsibility to develop good personal hygiene practice in their food workers. And as I said, if you have food workers who are trained, perfect. If they are not trained, the management's responsibility is to train them. Personal cleanliness and good health are an essential element of food safety and the personal cleanliness and the good health, of course, of the food workers. Food workers must also behave in a manner that will safeguard food safety, which then will safeguard public health. Delivery personnel or the public should not be allowed to enter food handling areas. If this is unavoidable, they must wear protective clothing. Again, all to prevent cross-contamination. Next one, please. Next slide. Yeah, of course, food can be contaminated by personnel who behave in an unhygienic manner. So that is a potential hazard from staff and it has to be prevented. And furthermore, inadequate facilities for food workers can contribute to poor personal hygiene. And it's up to the management to see to it that they change into uh, protective clothing once entering the food production area. And again, everything to prevent cross-contamination. Next slide, please. Here you see some protective clothing for visitors. Um, all personnel employed in food storage or preparation areas must wear protective clothing or uniforms. And the protective clothing or uniforms must be adequate to cover all outdoor clothing, at least to below the waist. What you see here actually is uh, myself in the middle and my, my son on the left, whom I took to an inspection in, uh, in Azerbaijan. This protective clothing is, of course, very fragile and only... Uh, only useful for um, a short time uh, and not for workers, it's uh, just for visitors. Protective clothing must be maintained in a clean condition and must not be worn outside the premises because, of course, it can be contaminated by anything from birds to whatever they touch and then bring it back into the food handling area. Hair covering should be provided to ensure the risk of physical contamination. To ensure that the risk of physical contamination is reduced. And again, it's not a matter of food safety, hair in hair of somebody in the food, but it's a matter of hygiene. And that is also, we want a high level of hygiene, so no hairs from anybody in our foods. Next slide, please. Now, critically, of course, important in the prevention of contamination. Food workers must, must wash their hands, including their forearms, when exposed. Use non-perfumed antimicrobial liquid soap. Hands should be dried using single towers. Air hand dryers should not be used in areas where food is exposed. And I put why. And of course, in a normal situation, we would be in a in a hall where participants uh, can uh, react directly uh, to the why. Uh, now this, of course, situation the leads, uh, makes this impossible, so I will answer the why. And of course, you already know by now, because you've listened very carefully, the why is to prevent cross-contamination. And because hand dryers, they blow air, so they blow air with uh, uh, microbes, to whatever they, uh, whoever, whatever strength the air blow is, and that is a risk of cross contamination. So the best way is to use paper towels and then throw the paper towels away after hand washing. Next slide, please. When do we need to wash your hands? Now this is the whole list before start work, before to handle cooked or ready to eat food. 
before putting on disposable gloves, gloves, after using the toilets, after handling refuse, after using a handkerchief, after touching hair or skin, after cleaning duties, after handling or preparation of raw foods. Uh, cleaning duties I have doubled here and after eating, drinking or smoking. And the hands need to be washed with really clean water because when you touch the food, the clean water, the water will touch the food. Next slide, please. Now, another part of the hygiene plan of a food business operator is, is, uh, is uh, in the personal hygiene plan, uh, you need to think what you accept. Um, most uh, food business operators, they tell their staff no jewelry. And of course, fingernails must be kept clean, free from nail varnish, no perfume or aftershave, no smoking. That is, of course, a big thing, uh, a big cause of contamination. No coughing, sneezing over food, nail biting, no picking, finger tasting or spitting. And especially in these uh, COVID-19 uh, days, this is more uh, important than ever. And uh, staff needs to handle food and food contact materials as little as possible. Again, avoiding cross-contamination. Cuts, sores and grazes must be covered after treatment with a highly visible, suitable dressing that will not pose a risk of physical contamination to the food. And of course, highly visible, that is good so you can see uh, that it's covered. And you can also see when the when it's coming loose. Next slide, please. Now, of course, here you see people uh, wearing gloves and then, of course you need to wash your hands before and after wearing disposable gloves. Maybe somebody else has worn them. Um, so there were, we need to be uh, preventing cross combination again. Gloves are changed between tasks and gloves are only used for a single operation. Of course, some gloves are used uh, longer, like you see them here, where they are used during uh, filleting of fish, fish. And the use of gloves is not a substitute for frequent hand washing. And of course, you need to train your staff that they know that gloves are a potential source of food contamination. Next slide, please. Now, avoid direct handling of ready-to-eat food by using tongs or other utensils. Why? Again, uh, avoiding cross-contamination. Uh, ready-to-eat food is going directly into the consumer's mouth. So any cross-contamination can already cause a direct problem. And again, food contact surfaces, cups, cutlery, plates should be handled as to avoid contamination. Of course, in the cleaning plan, it needs to be stated how often uh, surfaces are cleaned, disinfected and rinsed, depending on the sort of operation you are uh, setting up. Next slide, please. And again, as I said uh, earlier, um, any person suffering from or a carrier of an illness that might be carried over in food must immediately report the illness uh, to the business operator. Um, so the business operator must to build trust in his workers that they will not be punished uh, if they report an illness or a possible uh, infection. And then, of course, uh, the best way to uh, to achieve this is that to to give them some other work uh, and make sure that they uh, are not permitted to handle food and not permitted to enter a food handling area. Again, avoiding cross contamination. Next slide. 
Now, of course, the, an adequate number of toilets to be provided and connected to an effective drainage system. Lavatories are not to open directly into food rooms in which food is handled. And what is an adequate number of toilets? That is really up to the food business operator. But as an inspector, uh, we look at the toilets um, and see if they are clean to be used, if they are, uh, if there are too few toilets for too many staff, um, the toilets become dirty and, and that we can see. Uh, of course, you can also put a staff next to the toilet so that the toilets are always clean. In that case, you need less, a less number of toilets, but it's up to you to make sure that, uh, up to the, you, the food business operator, to make sure that um, that staff can use toilets and the toilets are not a source of contamination to the staff and then later on to the food. Equally, an adequate number of wash basins need to be provided, suitably located and designated for hand washing, hot and cold running water, materials for cleaning hands and for hygienic drying must be provided. Now, the EU legislation introduced Many years ago, the, um, the need for non-hand operable water taps, and it could be elbow, knee, or electronically operated. And again, why? And you know that by now, this is uh, becoming, a, becoming a constant uh, a message preventing cross-contamination. Next slide, please. And that's the last one, um, a fishing boat from the Netherlands. I thank you for your attention, and I think if you um, learned from this little uh, uh, talk, avoiding cross-contamination is utmost important in the European legislation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Gerard. Very comprehensive and valuable uh, information, uh, certainly in this period of the pandemic. Now yeah. we move to our next speakers. Uh, that is Mr. Robin Liu Xuyi, uh, CEO and co-founder of uh, Lab Companion uh, Berhad in Malaysia. Uh, Robin had a career in biotech space spanning almost 30 years. And he has demonstrated success in growing, developing new, new businesses by building strong and sustainable foundation, experience in sales, marketing, and business development, providing leadership and vision with ability to translate business idea into reality and profitability, proactive and able to understand industry trends to stay ahead and above competition. Robin has worked as consultant and trainers in various international technical assistant programs in Malaysia, Brunei, Bangladesh, Indonesia, and I suppose uh, now is in Myanmar, uh, funded by the European Union and other countries for establishing R&D training and consultancy divisions. Robin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Ibu Evelyn. Uh, thank you for your short and uh, kind uh, introduction. Um, now, let me just uh, very quickly just share my slide for today. The, uh, I'm going to share about the unfolding developments uh, of uh, SARS-CoV-2, or better known as COVID, uh, in uh, frozen food. Uh, um, and the title really is about the controversy, the implication, uh, the advisory, and what are some of the mitigation uh, steps. Uh, 
Just give me a minute. Huh? Okay. Now, let me just begin uh, with the big issue, the controversy about is SARS-CoV-2 a food safety risk? I think uh, depending on who you ask, there are differences in opinion. Then number two, uh, the perceived unilateral action to impose technical trade barrier. In other words, uh, many countries are not too happy with what is happening now with regards to China uh, in imposing certain, what they view as uh, unilateral action uh, with insufficient scientific background uh, to basically test for COVID-19 viruses in frozen food. Let me begin by looking at this. Is SARS-CoV-2 a food safety risk? If you, the WHO and FAO um, in their position paper uh, in April, they, meant they, they have stated that it is highly unlikely that people can catch or get infected by COV-19 from food or food packaging. And uh, the reason is simply because uh, from, from the scientific evidence, from understanding the, the virus, uh, the primary transmission route is through person-to-person -person contact and also through direct uh, contact with respiratory uh, droplets uh, generated when a person coughs or sneezes. Uh. That's the reason why, you know, today, uh, even everywhere, uh, one of the mandatory requirement is that we need to wear masks or at least some countries is recommended. But in Malaysia, for example, in public spaces, all of us must wear masks simply because uh, COVID can be spread through respiratory droplets. Uh, and in the same position paper, they mentioned that there is no evidence to date of virus uh, can be transmitted via food and food packaging. Now in September, this is also another uh, statement that was released by the International Commission uh, for on microbiological specifications for food. Huh? And what they're actually saying is that it is less likely possibility huh, that uh, virus can be spread via cross-contamination from surfaces. And uh, the, the, uh, through the recently published paper by uh, Professor Goldman from uh, Rutgers University, he says that uh, chance for transmission through inanimate surfaces appears to be very small. So these are basically academician uh, as well as uh, microbiologists who raise this whole issue to the fact that it is uh, the risk of transmission is very low. This is what they're saying. However, they also recognize that to date, there has not been any evidence that food or food packaging or food handling is a source of transmission. Now, this is actually stated uh, in September uh, 2020. So if you look at, uh, and if you hear the different position from, from different sources, uh, there is uh, divergent views uh, on the risk of COV in uh, food transmission. Now, I think the, thing that has been happening is that, uh, however, China is uh, taking a slightly different position. Uh, and uh, this, these are some articles that uh, came out uh, at, uh, uh, published in the Food Navigator. And uh, um, what China is actually focusing really is on what they call prevention strategy to tighten import regulations. In other words, um, China wants to assure that uh, whatever frozen food or what they call a cold chain food coming into China uh, should not 
or at least should be checked for COVID uh, contamination. And the statement released uh, is that exporters will comply with Chinese laws, regulation, and standards. And uh, it is on this basis, um, you know, it has caused um, a lot of uh, tension, unhappiness with uh, uh, exporting companies, with, with governments all over the world, because the position is totally different. And China is insisting uh, that uh, they will uh, tighten import regulations. Now, this is a timeline uh, since uh, June, uh, where there was actually, you know, China is the only country now in the world where COVID-19 has been controlled much better. Uh, and I was just checking with Jiawei. Uh, yeah, there is still some uh, outbreak, but everything is under control and at very low numbers. Now in June, 2020, uh, after a couple of months without a local transmission, there was a unexplainable outbreak and in June, 2020, and they trace it back to Beijing, uh, Sinfadi Agriculture Wholesale Market. Uh, and uh, when the inspectors went in to check and they did environmental swap, they found uh, basically they detected uh, the uh, COVID-19 on cutting board and the subsequent investigation also revealed that a lot of those that uh, caught COVID were somehow connected to this particular market. And subsequently from there, the Chinese uh, uh, regulators uh, tightened screening of uh, COVID-19 in fo frozen food. Nah. And in July alone, there were nine reported cases. And uh, in August, 2020 in Shenzhen. This is the first case uh, that uh, COVID-19 was actually detected on the surface of frozen chicken wing, uh, frozen chicken, uh, sorry, from Brazil. Uh. And uh, in October 2020 uh, in Qingdao, uh, it was reported that for the first time, live COVID-19 virus was recovered from frozen cod. Now this is a report that came out from China, but However, um, nothing much has been revealed in terms of the uh, findings of this particular case. It's just a report. Uh, and in November 2020 in Tianjin, again, uh, a cold storage worker that is, that is handling or managing uh, frozen food uh, um, came down with COVID-19. And this is basically just, just to show the different locations where products, frozen food products, uh, have been uh, tested and found positive with COVID-19. All right, and uh, because of that, uh, China has started to impose uh, regulation, very strict checks, and uh, these are some reports that uh, you can actually glean it off from their customs uh, notification. Like for example. Uh, in December alone, uh, Pakistan, uh, three outer packaging samples uh, for batch of frozen Panahia Argan Tata, all right, was detected positive for COVID-19. Uh, from Argentina, uh, outer packaging sample of one batch of frozen boneless beef was also detected positive. Uh, from Brazil, all right, uh, two beef company, uh, outer packaging was detected and found to, they detected COVID. Uh, India, in December alone, one inner packaging. Now this is inside the, the package product. All right, they found uh, COVID. And recently in Indo from Indonesia as well, uh, this is 3rd of December, uh, outer package, as well as inner packaging of frozen fish paste uh, was found to contain uh, COVID-19 uh, virus, all right? So China has actually uh, uh, tightened their import regulations and uh, the unhappiness from many countries is the fact that uh, 
uh, they still say that there is no enough scientific evidence to show that COVID is a food risk, uh, uh, is a food safety risk. Yeah? Now, so that is the controversy. And let's very quickly look at the implication. Uh, how is the uh, SARS-CoV-2 test done? I just want to just share a little bit uh, so that you all can get an uh, understanding and idea how the test is done. And what does it mean if you get a positive nuclear acid test from a packaging material or from the surface of the food? What does that mean? All right, let's look at... Uh, now, this particular slide basically just shows uh, uh, the, the how the virus will look like. And uh, let me just explain here what you actually see here is about, oh, sorry, 30,000, uh, 29,903 uh, base pad. This refers to the genomic size or the size of the nuclear acid in the virus itself. It's not very big. Uh, it consists about 30,000 base pair. And when we run what we call a, a reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction for COR, uh, SARS-CoV-2, basically what we are looking at is to detect the presence of the N gene that codes for the uh, nucleocapsid of the COVID-19 virus, as well as the E gene, the envelope that codes for the envelope uh, uh, proteins uh, on the virus. So based on the uh, molecular test, we are basically looking for the specific genetic or nuclear acid uh, signature that is specific to the N gene and the E gene. This is just for your information. Now, this is uh, how uh, the sample is actually done. Uh, this is done in our lab in Malaysia. Uh, okay, now China, they are insistent on the fact that it's not just uh, frozen aquaculture products. The regulation states frozen uh, 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 cold chain food. And, and one of the product that comes under this is frozen fruits that is exported to China. In Malaysia, we export a lot of durian uh, paste. And this is actually a example of a finished package, uh, package of uh, durian paste. And uh, what we did was that when the customers send the uh, sample to us, we basically do the inner swabbing of the inner packaging, all right, using a special sterile swab, all right, and you can just see it. Uh, this is in the transport media. And after that, we will do what we call the genetic extraction to get the RNA. And from there, we will basically uh, run the test. Huh? So this is actually a photo of what happens in the lab. Uh, this is a real-time PCR machine and the samples are loaded into the machine. All right, and the machine will basically uh, uh, amplify the uh, genomic material present. And if it is present, then it will actually give us uh, a reading. And from there, we can interpret, all right? So for example, as I said, the test uh, would actually detect the uh, E gene as well as the N uh, protein gene. So if we get amplification, all right, then we know that the uh, SARS-CoV-2 is present, all right? And at the same time, we can also detect uh, what we call SARS-CoV-like coronavirus, which is associated to the coronavirus family. Uh, now, the question is, if my sample is positive for nuclear acid test, what does that mean? Huh? All right, so the context is that the samples are taken from formites, 
in other words, surfaces or inanimate surfaces. Now, if it is a positive test, basically what it tells us is that the SARS-CoV-2 or the COVID-19 genetic material is detected. That means it is present. We, could, we can detect the genetic material. However, it does not mean that the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is viable with infectivity capability. I think this is one point of contention. We can detect the genetic material, but it doesn't mean that the virus is uh, viable or alive uh, or, or carrying that infectivity capability. What this test tells us, if it is a positive, is that there's contamination uh, of product or cross-contamination of product from the environment, uh, like our speaker Dirac has mentioned just now. And we know that uh, if there's contamination, very likely, in fact, all the time, it will be coming from workers or handlers that are sick or infected by the virus. All right. So the presence of a hazard may not constitute a food safety risk. This is what uh, the uh, WHO or even the uh, uh, different, different uh, agencies are actually saying, all right, that it may not be infectious and it may not necessarily contribute to transmission, all right? However, this point is being debated. As far as China is concerned, the policy is zero, zero tolerance uh, for the virus. Whether it is uh, transmissionable or otherwise, I think uh, uh, that is open to debate. And we need to continue to just wait for more evidence to come forward uh, from research and, and from what is happening worldwide. All right, now, therefore, um, now what is happening? So what can be done? All right, uh, I think in this article, basically it says that uh, what China will be looking at now is that they will want to look into virtual food import spot checks and to tighten cold chain guidelines. Huh? And uh, the uh, GACC is the uh, General Administration of uh, Customs of China, uh, has communicated with the competent authorities in exporting countries the need to adhere to international FAO and WHO food industry guidelines. Basically, what it's actually saying is that uh, all food producers in every country that exports to China must uh, follow uh, food safety um, industry guidelines uh, as outlined by FAO and WHO. Uh, and China will also be looking at long distance video monitoring and inspection systems, uh, all right, as well as spot checks. And they will also be strictly uh, implementing uh, COVID-19 chain guidelines. Uh, uh, the technical guidelines for prevention and control of COVID-19 of cold chain food production and operations, uh, technical guidelines for the prevention and control of COVID-19 in cold chain uh, operations. All right. So this is what China is doing. And as far as I understand from my conversation with different parties in China, very soon the uh, SAMR, will be issuing uh, uh, guidelines and protocols and procedure on how to test and also how to sample. All right, we just have to wait for the official announcement. Now, mitigation, all right, with all of these things uh, that is happening, uh, I think it is very important uh, to look at what can be done or what action can be taken to reduce, to control the possible uh, COVID-19 uh, contamination of uh, the uh, frozen uh, food. Huh? I think one very important thing we need to remember is that the purpose of testing, all right, in, in the whole area of food safety really is to test 
and evaluate the robustness and effectiveness of systems put in place in the first place. Huh? Basically, what I'm trying to say is that uh, the amount of testing that we do basically is to test whether the, our, our SOP that is in place, our hygiene or our sanita sanitary practices or policies, huh, whether they are effective or not. All right. So testing is really to evaluate whether the system is holding up well or basically it is failing us now. All right. And uh, this particular flow process basically tells us or shows us um, the complexity of a supply chain. Eh? And uh, for example, in this picture, uh, you know, even if, if it is from the uh, ship factory that catches fish from the ocean, if workers are infected with COVID, they, this is one possibility that the raw material, the product itself, or the harvest subsequently can be contaminated by the virus, all right? And uh, even the transportation, the tools that is used to process or to transport uh, the product can also be means for uh, cross-contamination by the virus, all right? And in seafood or in processing plant where workers come in contact, with the actual product during processing. And this is these are points where the virus can cross-contaminate uh, the, the product uh, or handling in storage and subsequently the transportation all the way to consumer, okay? Now, I think when we talk about what are steps that can be taken, uh, there needs to be basically review of what we call workers' fitness. Uh, in other words, their health status, temperature checks, and so on and so forth. Then there also needs to be a review of procedural fitness. What are the SOP or what are the systems in place now in the production? Are they, are they can they stand up to these new challenges where you know, we find COVID cross-contaminating uh, uh, food products or frozen products? Then there are the whole area of uh, environmental uh, environment fitness, for example. Okay, uh, so therefore, food manufacturers, uh, inspectors, or HACCP, uh, uh, QA and QC needs to relook into the whole hygiene uh, standards practices, the sanitary practices, and even now with COVID nineteen, the three C. Yeah? Uh, avoid, you know, uh, try to reduce crowded places, talk, uh, talks about social distancing, uh, avoid close contact, and also uh, reduce or avoid confined and closed spaces. All right. And this, uh, this is a recent paper that was just published uh, this year. Um, and basically listing out what are some of the uh, measures, safety measures uh, during this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, all right, from the whole area of uh, personal uh, health status, all right, to uh, hygiene, all right, to sanitary uh, practices, and to also working in the environment. So these are new uh, reviews or, or criteria that needs to be looked at or implemented even in, in, in uh, the uh, food production uh, facilities. Huh? Again, as I shared in the last time, uh, increasingly, uh, we need to be aware, all right, that at every part of the supply chain handling, uh, we need to begin to emphasize and re-educate uh, the workers and the handlers huh? the different areas that they need to pay close attention to. Uh, I think at the end of the day, uh, what I want to just say from our own experience is that sometimes in many uh, production facility, they have systems. Uh, the system is only as good uh, if it becomes a culture, all right? So 
many places they 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 go for hassle. They try to get certification, but if it is not practiced, if it is not uh, uh, becomes part of the culture, then there is also problem. All right, and therefore, basically, this slide shows that you know food safety. We, they, there needs to be the culture of science plus the social science, the human aspect, as well as understanding food science, and we need to combine all this. Uh, and to relook and to review the whole food safety policy and measures. And it, they, we need to have basically buy-in, all right? We need to have uh, training. We need to also have uh, transparency and communication in the whole area of uh, uh, education as well and the practices of it. Now, in conclusion, uh, uh, as I've said, the situation is still very fluid and is still unfolding and changing. Uh, I think for us now, outside of China, uh, what are some of the external things that we, 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 we should look at? I think for us, uh, we'll be looking into China. What are their standards that will be introduced soon? And what are the procedures uh, in terms of, uh, for example, testing or the sampling and so on and so forth. I think for internally for food producers, we need to relook again to review what are the policies, what are the standard operating procedures uh, with regards to our food safety practices uh, in terms of hygiene, sanitation, uh, and so on and so forth, so that we need to emphasize the culture of food safety. All right. Uh, so with this, I will uh, end my presentation today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robin, for a very uh, <clears throat> a comprehensive explanation and very updated uh, up to date uh, because it is a very uh, interesting to topic at the moment where everybody is talking. <laughs> Thank you. And we move uh, further to uh, our next speakers, uh, Mr. Zhao <clears throat> Wei Wang from China. Uh, food and he is a food and uh, nutrition regulation consultant from China in food made information technology. Zhao Wei has a broad knowledge about China custom process and requirement like CIQ label and so on of the food products besides an extensive expertise in Chinese food regulation like FSMP, infant formulas, hard food and food additive. He also has a rich project management experience in dairy products development and in food compliance reports. Zhao Wei, the floor is yours. Thank you, Evelyn. Uh, thank you, uh, guys. Good morning and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm glad to have a speech on this webinar. And thank you for Robin for introducing the policies in China. As he said, uh, this policy is on the COVID-19 pre prevention make many countries unhappiness and uh, unpleasure, but to be honest, it's very effective. So we should take some measures to meet the requirements if you want to export to China. <clears throat> so today my topic is the process of exporting seafood to China. Basically, the whole process can be divided into three parts, which are preparation before entry, inspection during entry, and the supervision after entry. Here is a flowchart of the export process. The preparation before import can be divided into four levels of requirements, including the country, uh, food production, business, 
importers and the exporters and the products. <clears throat> At the national level, system evaluation and the review of the exporting country is very important. The customs will evaluate and uh, review the food safety management system of the importing, exporting country. <clears throat> Companies who want to export to China need to register first. Moreover, importers and the foreign food exporters must file online. There are many special requirements for products such as certificates of origin and the special food registration and the filing requirements. When you arrive at port, you should declare your product to the customs. After acceptance, the product should be loaded on the specific place for inspection. After inspection, the customs will release the qualified food. Importers will establish import and uh, sales records. For the unqualified food, customers will return or destroy the product and issue the information about this product. In addition, customs will check import and sales records have retrospective review record the food. Next, I will introduce some important steps in the export process. First, first is the system assessment. Chinese customs conducts assessment and review the food safety management, management system of countries that export food to China to determine whether the food safety standards of the country can meet the accept, acceptable risk protection level in China and whether the food produced under this system can meet the requirements of Chinese laws, regulations, and the food safety standards. If the risk assessment results shows the risk is controllable, the Chinese customs shall sign protocols and uh, some agreements and uh, public the food list that approved to export to China. At present, there are eight types of products should be assessed, include, in, including meat, dairy products, uh, seafood, bird's nest, casings, um, plant uh, derived, de derived foods, Chinese medical medicinal uh, material, and uh, B products. I searched the Indonesian seafood and found the 206 kinds of seafood that can be exported to China. If you ensure your product is on the list, then you need to move to the next stop, next step. Res registration of overseas manufacturer enterprises. According to the regulations, seafood manufacturers uh, should register to Chin Chinese customers. <clears throat> so here is the latest list of Indonesian companies that have registered. During this update, we can see there are 563 companies can export to China legally and around 100 companies were deleted. Besides the manufacturer registration, the exporter and the importer also need to record their information online. Only the person who have implemented the reg registration system can handle the procedures for importing seafood. Finishing these registrations, you can ship your product to China. When you declare your product, 
you should provide the following information, like the registration information, uh, contract invoice. You can also upload the health certificate and the certificate of origin online. If you should be mentioned, uh, it should be mentioned that in China, imported seafood should be stored in cold storage or other places, uh, which is de uh, designated by the customs. At present, uh, there are 83 specific ports for imported seafood. Other ports do not accept customer clearance review of seafood. So it is, should be pay attention to. After loading your product and uh, de declaring your product, the customs will start inspection. They use the risk classification supervision. Uh, let's look at this picture. This system is divided into four stages. The first one is regular separation. Customs will review the documents batch by batch and uh, take around uh, 300 samples per catalog category. Uh, of course, uh, the customers may not uh, take so many samples. It depends on the quantity of your products and uh, your export times. If they found unqualified products, they will issue a warning notice and uh, list the product in strengthening separation. Uh, at this stage, sampling frequency will increase to more than 30%. If more than 60 batches of products are qualified, they can be turned to regular separation. In the same way, if the customs found unqualified products which are SD2, they will issue the uh, warning notice and uh, put them in the stage three detention supervision. At this stage, uh, the sampling frequency will increase to 100%, and the importer must submit qualified inspection report. If you want to return stage two, you should ensure more than 300 batches of products are qualified. If unqualified uh, products were found more than three times during detention supervision, the customs will start the product import assessment procedure. Uh, if it is high risk, the product will be banned from import. So this is the whole risk classification supervision system in China. We can see it is very important for importers to ensure the safety and the quality of their products and to meet the requirements of customs. So what items will the customs inspect? I just summarize these eight items. <clears throat> First is the documents, as I mentioned above, such as the contracts, um, packing lists, uh, health certificate. Uh, you should take these documents with your track or, or submit online. The heavy metals uh, and uh, also the organics. Um, this, to uh, this toxic substance should not excite, exceed the limit in imported seafood. The next is sensory test. Uh, products should have the proper color and the normal test and the smell. Uh, for example, salmon, uh, it should have bright orange, orange color and the clear muscle texture and uh, the fish should be elastic. And the next is packages. 
uh, in this period, packages test is a uh, is a very important and necessary measure to avoid the transport of COVID nineteen. Just as Robin said, for the cold chain products from high risk countries or regions. Customs increase the number of sampling and the testing, and strictly implement 100% nucleic acid sampling testing of imported seafood. Microbe test mainly include the salmonella, uh, listeria, uh, and the staphylococcus arrows for ready to eat uh, raw seafood. Total number of colonies and uh, coliform tests are also necessary. Besides that, uh, parasites and uh, diseases should uh, should not uh, should not be tested positive in your product, as well as the pesticide and uh, with veterinary drugs. After this inspection, if imported uh, seafood pass the, the inspection, the customers shall issue the certificate of inspection and the quarantine of intro of intro in entry goods, which shall be approved for production, processing, sale, and use. This certificate shall indicate the traceability information, such as the container number, production batch number, uh, manufacturer, and the mark of imported uh, seafood. Imported seafood that fail to pass the inspection will be destroyed, returned, or technically rectified. When your product enters the Chinese market, uh, please do not think your company are safe. The customs will start uh, retrospective review. They may regularly or irregularly to review the import qualification of your companies whether your company meets the requirements of customs, whether the products follow China's food safety standards and regulations. Moreover, uh, they may check the record of your import agency's review and the evaluation of your company. If they find that your companies do not meet the requirements, uh, they shall ask you to rectify. If unqualified, if it is still unqualified after evaluation, the customs shall cancel the excess qualifications and ban the import. In addition, uh, another matter you should pay attention to is the traceability. When the products enter the Chinese market, they should be rec uh, re they should be recorded uh, on the online traceability system. Um, at present, Beijing, Shanghai, and other provinces are promoting the establishment of online traceability platforms. From November 1st, uh, Beijing has implemented a four uh, a cold chain food traceability platform. Seafood transported from other place into Beijing need to register on the platform via website or smartphone. According to the system, you can easily get all the information of the product, such as product information, uh, product testing results, uh, logistics information, um, that means you should uh, record those information and uh, submit it online when you export your products. So that it not only can 
improve the safety of your product, but also reduce your losses uh, if there are some problems. The instance of the traceability system is the information traceability. I just divided the traceability into three parts. For product traceability, the warehouse records, delivery records, and the sales records are very important. If you want to trace the process, you may check these records to, to find the problems. If you confirm the problem is in the raw materials, ch just check the receive records or purchase records to find which supplier can uh, cause these problems. Therefore, uh, record all the process is very necessary for a food manufacturer. So, okay, to summarize, the process of exporting seafood to China includes three stages. Before entry, you should register for your company, file the exporter information and prepare other necessary information and the documents. During entry, uh, make sure the quality, quality, uh, quality and the safety of your products. In fact, you should uh, take measures before entry the port. For example, you may, you may need to uh, uh, disinfect and clean your vessel every day, clean the gloves, clothes, uh, the tools, the trunk, and uh, all the places which may contaminate by the virus or microorganisms. After entry the port, uh, make sure your traceability information is complete and uh, the and continue to pay attention to your products and the business registration status. So okay, uh, this is all the contents of my presentation. Uh, thank you for listening. If you have any questions of important export of food compliance, um, please contact us via this email. Uh, and uh, you can find more useful information from our website or just follow us on LinkedIn. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much, uh, Joey, for a, a very uh, clear and comprehensive uh, <clears throat> explanation on how to export to China. So we move to our <clears throat> last but not least speakers, Mrs. Diane uh, Harini. Uh, Diane is deputy director of uh, testing lab laboratory, our partner of uh, the PT Mutu Agung Lestari, known as Mutu International. She has more than 27 years experience in laboratorium and follows regularly proficiency tests from uh, Wageningen Food Safety Research, known as Rikild before, from the Netherlands and also from other countries. Diane, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Ibu Evelyn. Thank you for your uh, short uh, introduction. Uh, so uh, before uh, we start to uh, discuss about the uh, proficiency testing, uh, let me introduce for the our laboratory profile. Mutu International is a company provide the testing, inspection, and certification services. Established in 1990, Mutu International has become the largest Indonesian private company, and it still fills more than 1,500 clients from Indonesia and Asia Pacific. And now Mutu International has uh, expanded by expanding the company. 
the company swing uh, to Singapore, China, and also Japan. Our vision is uh, to be the leading uh, sustainable radar, uh, radar institution and acceptable internationally. Contribute the development and smooth running of international trade, providing excellent service uh, to client independently with the support competent human resources, professional as well as on an uphold the moral integrity. Developing a service oriented to the demands on the market effective and effectively. Providing benefit and added value to employee and the stakeholder. This is our laboratory. We have a calibration laboratory and also testing laboratory. Uh, calibration laboratory location in the depot and for the testing, we have uh, some uh, brands uh, beside in Depok. We have in Samarinda, Pekanbaru, Pangkalan Bun, uh, Medan, and also China. And uh, uh, almost of them, uh, we have a uh, environment and microbiology uh, laboratory. And in China, we have a uh, one uh, wood testing laboratory. In Depok. Uh, we have a food laboratory that uh, food laboratory uh, now very active uh, participate uh, and we have a, we have a contract with the Ministry of uh, Fisheries we have uh, appointed by Ministry of Fisheries uh, and we conduct some testing uh, in the national monitoring residue program. This is our certificate accreditation uh, that we have a number uh, 001 that we are the first laboratory in Indonesia that uh, get the accreditation. And uh, for food laboratory, uh, this is our laboratory. Uh, we have conduct the Best, uh, the testing for pesticide residue such as uh, organochlorine, organophosphate, peritroid, carbamat, and others. And for antibiotics, we uh, test the nitrofuran, uh, chloramphenicol, tetracycline group, emamectin, uh, dyes like uh, malacid green, leucomaracid green, uh, crystal violet, and leucocrystal violet. Also, we uh, test the quinolone or exalfoxin. Uh, for mycotoxin, we uh, conduct the test for aflatoxin and okratoxin. Uh, heavy metal uh, like uh, lead, cadmium, and mercury, and also essential metal. And uh, for nutrition, uh, the test we conduct uh, like a proximate, uh, like moisture as protein, fat, carbohydrate, and crude fiber. Fi crude fiber. And for microbiology uh, laboratory, we conduct uh, the test for total plate count, E. coli, coliform, yeast, and mold, clostridium prefingers, salmonella, enterobacter, Staphylococcus aureus, Bacillus cereus, uh, Vibrio parahemoticus. Okay, that's a uh, short uh, introduce for our laboratory. Uh, then uh, if you still want to know more, you can visit our uh, website at the www.mutucertification.com. Okay, now uh, we start for the uh, proficiency test uh, that a tool for evaluate and to improve laboratory performance. Uh, as we know, uh, the laboratory task is to carry out the test according to the customer request. And uh, the output of the testing uh, of the laboratory is the certificate of testing of, or uh, we can say testing report. 
The testing report will be used uh, for the customer uh, or the other parties to make a decision. Uh, the decision is uh, with the respect to purpose in the field of uh, sucks as uh, the trade, health, security, security, and also the compliance uh, some regulation. So the testing result from the laboratory should be valid, objective, and reliable. Reliable data will generate reliable decision. And the uh, validity uh, of data uh, the laboratory need to implement uh, a quality assurance system and the evidence that the laboratory has to implement a quality system, uh, assurance system, uh, it will be proven by the laboratory with an accreditation certificate. Usually we uh, know it as an ISO 17025. Uh, based on the ISO uh, 172 zero to five uh, clause 7.7 uh, 7, uh, ensuring validity result laboratory uh, shall have procedure for monitoring the validity of the result the resulting data shall be recorded in such a way that trends are detectable and were practicable statistical technique shall be applied to the review the result uh, this monitoring shall be planned and reviewed and shall include where, uh, where appropriate but not limited to uh, use uh, reference material or quality control material, use alternative instrumentation that has been calibrated to provide the traceable result. Functional checks of measuring and testing equipment. Use check or working standard control chart where appropriate uh, where applicable, intermediate checks on measuring equipment, replicate, uh, replicate tests or calibration using the same or different method. Uh, or we also can conduct the retesting or recalibration uh, of the retained uh, item. Uh, we also can um, make a correlation of the result with the different characteristic of an item also a review of a reported result and we also can uh, conduct intra-laboratory comparison uh, intra-laboratory comparison means uh, la comparison testing between uh, another staff of laboratory within the laboratory uh, or also using uh, testing of blind sample then the laboratory uh, shall monitor its performance by comparison with the result uh, to another laboratory where available and appropriate. This monitoring shall be planned and reviewed and it shall include but not be limited uh, to either or both the following. Uh, there is a participant participation in uh, proficiency testing and also uh, inter-laboratory testing that we uh, uh, we let me know as external performance monitoring. So what is the difference between intra-laboratory comparison, inter-laboratory comparison, and proficiency test, uh, test, testing? Based on ISO IEC 17043, uh, intra-laboratory comparison is an organization performance and evaluation of measurements or a test on the same or similar item within the same laboratory in accordance with the predetermined condition. Uh, An inter-laboratory comparison or uh, we say as ILC uh, is organization performance and evaluation for measurement or test on the same or similar item by two or more laboratories in accordance with a predetermined condition. Uh, proficiency testing is evaluation of participant performance again pre-established criteria by means of interlaboratory comparison. Uh, sometimes uh, we know that interlaboratory comparison or ILC almost same with the proficiency testing. 
but the proficiency testing usually uh, conducted by the uh, professional and uh, independent uh, independent uh, body. So what is standard uh, we use in this uh, difference? Uh, so regarding the laboratory accreditation, uh, we use ISO ISE 17025. It's a general requirement for the competence and of testing and calibration laboratories. Uh, and uh, for pro uh, proficiency testing provider uh, accreditation, they use uh, ISO ISE 17043. There is a conformity assessment general requirement for proficiency testing. And uh, for statistical method, uh, usually uh, the provider use uh, ISO 13528 uh, statistical method for use in proficiency testing by interlaboratory comparison. This is uh, the step when uh, we want to uh, participate in, in the proficiency test. First, usually the laboratory uh, will uh, searching then select what the kind of the proficiency test that uh, they want to follow, then apply. Uh, then the provider will uh, prepare some protocol, sample preparation and the check homogeneity and stability test. Uh, and after that, they are distribution uh, the sample. Then uh, the participating laboratories uh, will receiving the sample, then uh, they are check uh, the condition of the sample, then conduct the test. Uh, then after uh, the test finish, they are submit the test uh, to the provider. Uh, after that, the provider will evaluation uh, and make the report. Uh, based on the report, the participating laboratory uh, will be monitor uh, of their performance. The evaluate of the uh, proficiency test scheme, uh, there's uh, actually there's so many uh, prof uh, provider of a uh, proficiency test. Uh, such as uh, you can uh, check uh, in the internet, uh, the EPTIS database, there are so many uh, proficiency test scheme uh, there. Uh, then usually we also uh, follow the proficiency test conduct by FAPAS uh, and then also by Rikilt Wageningen uh, University Research and also uh, we can uh, ask the our national accreditation body that can provide detail of accredited accredited uh, provider of a PT and their associated scope. For Indonesia, you can check uh, in this uh, link. And also, we uh, particip uh, participate at the uh, proficiency test uh, conducted by Balai Uji Standar Karantina Ikan, Pengendalian Mutu dan Keamanan Hasil uh, Perikanan. This is uh, buskim uh, at gmail.com. Uh, and uh, another, there are still so many, many uh, provider. Uh, you can search uh, using the internet, uh, using the relevant keyword, and also provide a useful information. Uh, when we are conduct the testing uh, for uh, proficiency test. Uh, we should a uh, little bit uh, careful because uh, this is uh, our test, yeah. So for for the first time, you should read uh, proficiency test protocol carefully and uh, follow all of the uh, guidance uh, in the protocol. The, the protocol. Then the, you, we should check the sample condition. Uh, if there's uh, any uh, abnormal some uh, abnormal condition, we should uh, contact the uh, provider. Uh, and we should 
uh, pay attention also for the sample hand handling uh, because the we should make sure that the uh, sample uh, still in the good condition until we finish the testing uh, the testing uh, or after uh, the report uh, re reported uh, come out uh, sampling handling is very important to avoid the deterioration or contamination uh, loss or damage sample uh, when the, we conduct the testing we should uh, we should uh, uh, aware for the good laboratory practice and the treat uh, provider uh, proficiency test came uh, test item as a routine routine sample uh, and also uh, we should uh, check by IQC internal quality control using uh, uh, CRM control sample recovery uh, uh, RPD and etc. Uh, you can also uh, conduct the sample using the fire analysis uh, or fire instrument uh, for the test item if. Uh, the test item is available to conduct more than one time. Uh, so check uh, carefully before the reporting, for example, how many digits should be report, uh, how uh, about the unit, uh, dilution factor, uncertainty, uh, blank correction, recovery, uh, correction, and etc. Submit the result by due date. And the result of uh, evaluation, Z score is uh, mostly uh, use and uh, measurement uncertainty not uh, taken. Uh, so the formula is uh, like this, where uh, uh, X is the re result reported by participant and X is assigned value. Uh, and uh, for if uh, this is using if uh, Uncertainty is uh, using uh, in the formula like this. So for the assigned value, uh, usually the provider uh, can use uh, some uh, estimate through value. Uh, it is, uh, could be by formula formulation or CR uh, certificate reference value or reference value or can use a consensus value from the export of the laboratory or a consensus value from the participant. So uh, if uh, this is the result of evaluation, if the our Z score is uh, below, uh, the value is below two, the score indic indicates satisfactory. Uh, it means the performance uh, and no satisfaction satisfactory uh, performance and generates no signal. If uh, our Z score between uh, two and three, uh, the score indicate questionable uh, performance and generate a warning signal. And if the score uh, more than three, the score indicate unsat uh, unsatisfactory performance and generate an action signal. So what we should do uh, if our uh, proficiency test uh, result is uh, questionable or uns uh, unsatisfactory. Uh, so we should uh, checking by, for example, transcription error. Uh, maybe uh, it uh, caused uh, by clerical error, such as uh, transcription error, mislabeling, incorrect unit, uh, or decimal error. Or maybe there are also some technical problems such as uh, the storage or treatment of the uh, proficiency uh, test sample. Uh, or sample preparation, uh, we have a problem there. For example, wigging, uh, drying, extraction, digestion, uh, clean up, dilution, and etc. Uh, maybe uh, also have a problem in the method or internal quality internal con quality control data uh, or have a, some problem with the equipment or calibration 
or check also your regens is it still have a good condition or already expired uh, then how about the environmental condition and also data processing uh, besides of that maybe the problem also can uh, can be from the related to the provide uh, pro provider or pro uh, proficiency test scheme uh, maybe the some problem like uh, such is like matrix difference between uh, proficiency test uh, item and routine sample uh, potential proficiency test item deterioration uh, parameter concentration level outside of the scope of application of the method uh, maybe uh, also lack a stability or homogeneity of the sample. Inappropriate instruction to participant also maybe has uh, one of the cause uh, the unsatis uh, unsatisfactory or questionable uh, proficiency result. Inappropriate standard deviation for proficiency assessment and or incorrect data entry from the uh, provis uh, provider. So uh, what we should do after we uh, analyze the problem based on the raw data, uh, the overall performance of the round, uh, test result, successive interlaboratory studies, and internal quality data, uh, we will find the root cause. And after that, we should make a plan for corrective action and uh, execute uh, the record and corrective action and uh, check whether the corrective action was effective uh, with the, for example, we conduct the test again with the retained sample of a proficiency test, or we uh, follow the proficiency test again until we prove that uh, our uh, result is uh, satis uh, satisfied. Uh, so there's uh, so many benef benefit of for a proficiency test. Uh, it put uh, evaluation of laboratory performance, identifying measurement problem, comparing operating operator capabilities, comparing analytical system, improving the performance, exchange uh, information with the provider, uh, because usually the provider uh, will uh, have a meeting after uh, after reporting then they are, uh, have a discuss for the uh, the cause of the uh, unsatisfying result and also as uh, educating staff uh, instilling confidence in staff management and external user of the laboratory services uh, and also we will get the measurement uncertainty because some of the provider uh, also calculate the measurement of uncertainty uh, of the result. Uh, use the proficiency test item as internal quality control and uh, make a verification of method performance. So uh, proficiency tests uh, become uh, essential to, uh, to allow to all laboratories to making uh, measurement testing. From proficiency tests, uh, participation brings many benefit and enables many measurement to be monitored and improved. Uh, with a proficiency test, uh, a very powerful quality assurance tool and deepening uh, laboratory accreditation. Uh, and uh, for the Conclusion, uh, proficiency test uh, will give you the uh, will give the confidence for the laboratory uh, to to uh, make the real uh, re reliable test result. Uh, so uh, the user of the testing result will uh, make uh, the re reliable decision. Okay, uh, that's all my presentation. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Mudian. It is a very useful and interesting uh, 
<clears throat> information because we know always the result, but we don't know how the procedure that you are doing in the lab. Now it is everything very clear. So uh, now it is time for some questions. Do you have any questions? Is there any question or it is uh, very uh, <clears throat> clear for everybody so then they, they have no questions anymore. Well, in this case, and this is uh, the end of our webinar and it is our last webinar uh, for this year. But uh, beginning next year, we will have training with all these speakers, as you see, that is, uh, Hygiene is one of the most important uh, criteria for export of your, your fisheries products, uh, either to China, either to uh, uh, European Union or other countries. And also the lab test is part of it and biosecurity certainly uh, may not be <clears throat> neglected. So I hope to see you again uh, in next year in our one of our training uh, session and just keep in touch. And to whom is celebrating, I wish you a <clears throat> Merry Christmas and a very healthy, happy, prosperous New Year. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, can yeah, we you. take a picture maybe? Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, and then we uh, have a photo. Ending. Okay. I have one. Bentar ya, Bu. <laughs> Saya ambil yeah. semuanya dulu. Okay. Mungkin geser. Ya, yeah, geser logonya. Mungkin yeah. taruh di mana gitu. Logonya taruh atas. Logo ya, taruh atas. Taruh di situ. Yeah. Sini ya, Bu ya. Iya. Yeah. Oke, okay. siap satu dua tiga. Oke. Oke. Sudah. Oke. Thank you very much uh, for your contribution, and I hope to see you uh, next year. We will discuss uh, for the training, and uh, well, have uh, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye